So it's my pleasure to introduce our first panel of the symposium, Biography as History, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Philadelphia, and the Nation. This panel is moderated by Nicole Gonzalez Van Cleve, Associate Professor of Sociology at Brown University and dear friend to the John Hay Library. Our distinguished panelists are Elizabeth Hinton, Professor of History, African American Studies and Law at Yale University, Todd Stephen Burroughs, writer and public historian, consultant to the Mumia Abu Jamal Archive and Exhibition. And joining us virtually, thank you so much, is Heather Ann Thompson, the Frank W. Thompson Collegiate Professor of History and Afro-American and African Studies, professor in the Residential College, University of Michigan. Please give our panelists an applause. Well, thank you all so much. I hope you can hear me okay. Is that fine? Does that work? Um, I feel a little Oprah-like right now. This is so great. Um, so Heather is all the way in Europe right now. Can you hear us, Heather, just to make sure? Okay, test your mic. What city are you in, Heather? Okay, that's why, see, you see how, Slow hold on one second. So audio folks, if you can help. Um, we can't hear you, Heather, we see you. You look amazing and great. Your backdrop's awesome. You are well lit. But we are gonna fix the audio, so that's why I tested that out. So I wanna welcome everybody. I have to say that I was so emotionally moved by the music and I, um, I have to admit that I'm a sociologist by trade and so I love, like, talking to historians and learning from them because the fault in my field is that we take a very presentist view of the social world, meaning we look at a snapshot of now and we fail to interrogate the historic roots that got us here. Right. We act as though things manifested from a poof and now we have a prison. But today we're really gonna interrogate that and I am gonna admit that I love actually learning alongside historians. So. Some of the questions I'm gonna ask, it's a dangerous thing, but I don't know the answer. So, um, and I love that, that's why we're here. Um, and I want to look at Mumia Abu-Jamal's biography case and personal narrative against this backdrop of violence um, of the police state that was in Philadelphia, but also the nation. You know, I, I write about Chicago, but when I write about Chicago, I think, so, you know, how Chicago goes, there goes the nation, and certainly how Philly goes, there goes the nation. It, it tells us something about the social conditions upon which police violence and prisons are created and thrive, et cetera. Um, and so I want to start with, um, with Todd because Todd, you are a biographer for Mumia. And I always say, you know, some folks are coming into the, the symposium with a, t a lot of knowledge about Mumia, but could you just, you know, tell us a little bit about the stories of who Mumia is who he was before his incarceration and to not kind of narrate his biography for us so we can truly understand him. I can actually do that in one minute, but what I want to one do- One minute. I, but what I want to do before that, I just wanted to say some thank yous and everything. I want to thank sure. uh, Amanda and Chris, and I want to thank uh, Tiffany for finding me, you know, for, for finding me in, in the obscure New Jersey and grabbing me into this. So I wanted to thank that. I also wanted to acknowledge some people in the audience, uh, Baba Zaid Muhammad, who's been active in the political prisoner movement for decades, and uh, of course, Johanna Fernandez. And I want to do a special thank you to Noel Hanrahan, who read the first printing of my book and edited it page by page amazing. for free. <laughs> she That's is amazing. so committed to Mumia Abu Jamal. Yeah. And, and I want to thank her because I have another biography, because this, the book I have now is just my notes. Mm -hmm. My real biography, that's gonna come out, which, which is his uh, biography in terms of the journalistic perspective, is because of Noel mm -hmm. that I got to hear something that's a really treat. I got to hear Mumia's tapes mm. when he was walking the streets as a radio reporter. I got to actually hear his tapes and how he interviewed and all that. And that's only because of Noel Hanrahan. So could you yeah. give her a round of applause? Yes, yes, I see that right now. Now, I'll, I also want to say a couple things here about, about my panelists here. Heather, when I read your bio, I wanted you to adopt me. You are doing <laughs> exactly the kind of journalistic and scholarship work that I always wanted to do. So I'm glad one of us is out here doing that. And Dr. Hinton, I, I told you this privately, but I'm going to tell you this publicly because I want people to understand this. I am an adjunct Africana professor at Wayne State University and at Seton Hall University. And at Seton Hall, we just had a major struggle 
over uh, trying to get Africana studies back because it was fading. Mm -hmm. And the students took over the administration building for 14 days. People were not playing around. And it was because of people like Zaid and Larry Ham and the People's Organization for Progress helping these students and the other activists helping these students that we have now a three-member Africana Studies department. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to say to, to, um, to Dr. Hinton is that I have the honor of teaching the Martin Luther King Scholars. They are a mm -hmm. multicultural leadership group within the university. I have the honor of giving them a seminar. Mm -hmm. And I make required reading America on fire yes. because of the brilliance of Dr. Hinton. So I just yes. wanted to say that. Yes. We can always take time for those shout outs. <laughs> <laughs> Now, to do with me in one minute, I brought notes because I was intimidated. But you by can this take panel. longer. I, 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 we want to hear you. I was intimidated by this panel, so I brought notes, all right? But, but to do it in one minute, and then we can expand on this. Mumia Abu Jamal is a product of the Black Power Movement. He is a searcher. And he lived during a time in which you could search and actually find jobs and find relationships and find purpose. Mm -hmm within an African-American community. So he, his searches led him to the Black Panther Party. His searches led him to Goddard College, an experimental college. Terry Bisson, uh, his uh, authorized biographer, said that uh, Goddard was the only kind of college that would accept him, right? Uh, because he was avant-garde and Goddard was avant-garde. Mm -hmm. He discovered radio and trained on WRTI, the Temple radio station, mm -hmm. that later on tried to cut him off mm. when uh, Noel was putting commentaries out on Democracy Now! and WRTI cut Mumia the weekend before he was over the air. It was an exact repeat of what happened with NPR. Right. Um, but he, so ironically, that was the station he trained on. Right. And then after dropping out of college, because Mumia is a searcher, he then goes to WHAT and many radio stations across the dial, and some forces happen, some his fault and some the fault of the 70s becoming the 80s, that leads him to driving a cab mm -hmm. and to the situation we now have. Mm -hmm. See, I told you I could do it in one minute. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I wanna turn to Heather, because Heather, um, in your new book, I mean, um, I just want you to tell us a little bit about uh, the MOVE um, the move organization, Mumia's involvement, but also what did it mean in the landscape of Philadelphia? Because I, you know, I've seen Philadelphia police, I've seen them do lockdowns, curfews. That was all in the present day when we were both faculty at Temple. And can you tell us a little bit about what Mumia encountered at that time as, a, as an activist, as a Black Panther and as in possible, you know, is in affiliation with um, the MOVE organization. Can you all hear me now? Is that so? We can hear you. Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, first of all, thank you, Nicole. It's so great to see you and Elizabeth and Todd. I'm so happy to be here, albeit from afar. I'm actually just left London, still in the UK from Belfast. Uh, so I'm sorry I'm not there. I would really, I'm, I'm so sorry, especially not to hear that incredible music in person. It was amazing, uh, amazing enough to hear it as I have. Um, if you'll forgive me, Nicole, I think my remarks, I'm going to make just a little bit more formal because I can't really, uh, I'm not sitting next to you and I can't really see the audience. And so that way I might uh, uh, get more out in a shorter period of time. Is that okay with you? That is absolutely okay, but as I said to Todd, you guys have the floor. You're the stars. We want to hear from you, so take your time. We want to learn. Yeah, I think I'm just going to go. I don't normally do this, but I think I'm going to go a little bit more with the canned remarks just to kind of keep my thoughts together because That's I fine. am because I'm not there. Um, I mean, really, Todd, in one minute, you, you you cut to the chase of really what is so important to understand, and I just wanted to pick up on Nicole's question to add to this context really about Philly in this period to, I think, to understand Mamiya and why it's so important, uh, why his legacy in this archive is so important, why his present day voice is so important. We have to really understand that Philly context. And I think to really understand this context, we have to actually go back to the 50s, uh, to the 40s and note the fundamental fact that in Philadelphia, just like every other American city, injustice, inequality, and an utter lack of democracy has defined daily life for Black citizens. And 
really the entire history of Philadelphia, but just focusing a little bit right after World War II, it's just we got to kind of reckon with the fact that in response to the second great migration of Blacks to that city, and more importantly, to their insistence on being a part of everything that Philly had, jobs, housing, education, led white Philadelphians to cling to their own privileges and power with extraordinary and ever greater determination. And their proxy to do that, their boots on the ground to do that, was the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, I think that we really can't underestimate the extent to which this is true. The number of erroneous stop and frisks, as well as the gratuitous abuse meted out by the Philly PD in the 40s and in the 50s was staggering. It was so bad that in the 1950s, Black citizens insisted on a police review board that dutifully logged citizen complaints against the police from the late 50s forward. By the close of 1963 alone, just that year, that police board had logged a total of 411 complaints against officers in the, in the Philly PD. The allegations in these, play, these complaints were graphic, they were disturbing, but what the PAB found particularly troubling in these cases of these officers who, quote, without justification have beaten complainants, end quote, was their, quote, fellow officers made no effort to restrain them and in fact joined in. But whether it was in 1953 or 1963, the city still did nothing with these complaints. And so in an area of the city where police abuse was particularly rampant, North Philly, in August of 64, poor and black Philadelphians would eventually erupt in protest in one of the first urban rebellions of this period that Elizabeth narrates so incredibly. Their loudest demand that city officials finally address this issue of police brutality and make equal justice under the law a reality in this fourth largest city in America. When order was finally restored after that uprising, it was clear that city officials had been shaken uh, by the outrage of this event and had been forced to face in a pretty dramatic way the costs of ignoring police abuses. And thereafter, thanks to its continuous pressure and activism, a wider swath of at least the Black middle class managed to grab some more civic power in the city. But meanwhile, the white response, and I know Elizabeth will talk about this too, the white response to that uprising was to begin a historically un unprecedented war on crime, a massive federally funded effort, soon to be followed by an even more aggressive war on drugs, which meant that rather than reining in abusive officers, in fact, Philly would soon have a white law and order cop become the mayor, Rizzo, and he was personally committed to even more aggressive crackdown on the city and particular to Black Philadelphians, even more brutal policing. And so bad did those things become in this regard that in 1970, the U.S. Civil Rights Commission itself was called in to investigate police actions in Philly. As, it re as its report noted bluntly, not only were there three times as many Black citizens killed by policemen as white, between 1960 and 70, the number of Blacks being killed in the city was almost double that of the previous year and more than double the average from 1960 to 69. Worse, this report noted that the number of complaints against the police they investigated were, quote, only a small fraction of the number actually made. But those investigators noted something else, too. As they put it, quote, Black people are no longer reacting with their traditional tolerance and accommodation, but are beginning to clearly express an awareness that too often the recipients of unequal, that they are too often the recipients of unequal justice and illegal treatment. Well, if that was not an understatement, I don't know what was. Black Philadelphians had had enough. They, for example, had begun, had begun to sue the city and its police force, calling attention to the fact that Black Philadelphians were, as one lawsuit put it, compared to whites, quote, being picked up for questioning three to four times more, being kept in police stations for as much as 24 hours or more, and were picked up at early hours in the morning in their homes by large numbers of police officers armed with shotguns wearing bulletproof vests. These suits were successful. By 76, the Philly, D Philly PD had been forced to pay out millions of dollars in police brutality cases. But they didn't just sue. 
They also began organizing, and this kind of dovetails now with what Todd was saying, groups such as the Black Panther Party, the Revolutionary Action Movement, and also in the early 1970s, a new group, MOVE, began calling even more attention to the abuses of the, P the Philadelphia Police Department. MOVE in particular paid a high price for shining light on the police. From the earliest days, its members were arrested and beaten up in staggering numbers between 1971 and 1978. And indeed, Black and poor Philadelphians' very long history of suffering abusive police practices would all come to a head in that city in two particularly deadly moments in which MOVE members were on the front lines, one in 1978 in Powelton Village and the other in 1985 on Osage Avenue. And actually, this is the deeply important moment where the history of Mumia Abu Jamal comes in, of course, also important before then. But not only did Black Philadelphians come out of the up uprising of 64 determined to file countless lawsuits against the police, not only did they protest police actions at various pre precincts or take a stand as MOVE did in 1978 in Powhatan Village, but some of them, especially one Black journalist, Mumia Abu-Jamal, decided to shout out these abuses both on the radio and in writing, always making clear, especially after nine MOVE members were sentenced to 30 to 100 years for the death of one police officer in 78, that he wouldn't stop doing this until something real was done about the serious problem of unequal justice in the law under the law in that city. Well, needless to say, the Philly PD officers were not happy about this. In their attempt to silence their critics, they had managed to raise the home of MOVE in Powhatan Village, and it was their efforts that had sent nine MOVE members to prison for an eternity. But here was this guy who kept calling them out, not just for what had happened with MOVE, but for all that the police were doing in this city and in the nation more generally. And so notably, it was in North Philly, a part of the city that was still notorious for white cops treatment of poor black residents, where Momia Jamal ended up being critically wounded in a clash with four officers, by the way, cops who were well known to local residents, whom they had already dubbed the, horse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This event would not just take him off the radio, but it would land him on death row. In fact, so many, in many critical respects, this is when this, when, sorry, when this former reporter was sentenced to death in a Philadelphia courtroom, his case then and thereafter came to encapsulate exactly what had always been and continues to be at stake in Philadelphia when it came to the relationship between law enforcement and city blacks in the wake of the 64 uprising. The police had been determined to act with impunity in that city, and this man insisted unflinchingly on reporting of what that looked like and felt like in the lived lives of Black Philadelphians. And thus, it should not surprise any of us, even today, that it is inconceivable to particularly white police officers that Momia be freed, and it should surprise none, no one, that they found it so outrageous when he and his supporters succeeded in 2011, finally, to remove him from death row. To those who understand Philly's history, it is also in, un, inconceivable that Momia's conviction, let alone his now life sentence, can stand, given that that entire episode that led to it was informed by the well-established reality of police corruption and brutality in Philadelphia, and given the inescapable reality that there has never been equal justice under the law in that city, and given the collective witnessing of the Philly Police Department's seemingly unquenchable desire to exact revenge for anyone associated with MOVE, a desire, by the way, that dates back at least as far as the brutal events that unfolded in Powhatan Village in 1978 and those that culminated so horrifically in 1985 when the police bombed the move house on Osage Avenue, killing men, women, and children alike. So anyone that's paid any attention whatsoever to the history of the police in the city of Philadelphia, and frankly in any American city over the last 50 years, is haunted 
by the police practice of bending the law to fit their desires on the street. Indeed, so unreliable have police accounts been of every incident that resulted in the arrest of a Black Philadelphian that by August of 1995, a full 1,400 cases against six Philadelphia, Black Philadelphia, uh, sorry, against six officers were finally put under review. Thanks to the, by the way, efforts of one uh, public defender and his team. Only two years later, nearly 300 of those had been overturned. Those were people who were found to have landed where they did because of five renegade officers from one predominantly poor and Black North Philadelphia neighborhood, where they had been, according to the New York Times, quote, robbing, beating, lying, and planting phony evidence. And of course, for anyone who's been paying attention, when the new DA, Larry Krasner, began digging in with his new conviction integrity unit, it took very little time at all to determine that scores of people, people who, by the way, together had already served over 400 years in prison, were utterly innocent and had only landed behind bars because of the withholding of exculpatory evidence, the coercion of false confessions, and because of officers committing perjury on the stand. Of all those exonerated under the CIA, all but two individuals were black men. And in one of the more extreme cases, one man had been wrongfully convicted of murder in two separate cases and cleared of the crimes in both cases. So just in closing, this is the context within which Mumia's life story has unfolded. It's why it matters so much to all of us. And despite every opportunity city leaders have had, incidentally, Black city leaders and white city leaders alike since 1964, finally to act when Black residents, from the lone person on the street to those in groups like MOVE or intellectuals reporting on the Black experience like Momia, every time they were told of brutal policing they endured and made clear how rarely pe people got a fair shake in the court of law, nothing changed. And this, no matter how many, and, and thus, I'm sorry, no matter how many horrific events have taken place on their watch over the last five decades, like the police bombing of MOVE, Philadelphia, like every American city, remains a city of brutal and racialized policing, and it remains a place where the most basic democratic principle that all citizens are entitled to equal justice under the law is unrealized, and this is why the Momia fight continues today. Thank you. Amazing, Heather. Before I turn to Elizabeth about some of the broader national context, I have a couple follow-up questions, both rooted in kind of the present moment ver and versus um, the past. One is um, this history sounds so similar to Chicago, and I'm you know I'm thinking of Fred Hampton um, and the Chicago police. I'm thinking of the second you know the second migration and the fear of quote unquote neighborhoods turning black. One of the specific things that I saw in the archive in Chicago is the fear of white mobs, of just regular Chicagoans going around and burning black homes. And I remember uh, being at a park with my, my child in Philadelphia, and I was with a friend who's black, and an older, an elderly Italian woman said, you better be careful around here, because um, in the old days, uh, this was our space. Um, can you, you know, and it's one thing to kind of focus on police, but I, and I think you used the wonderful words, the boots on the ground, but there are landmarks everywhere. I mean, to play hockey in Philly, you have to go to Rizzo Rink. Uh, to hear stories like that when you go to the park with your child, you're hearing these white folks still stake claim. So can you talk a little bit about the average white citizen and the politics of that? Absolutely. I mean, actually, you know, this is why I use the term proxy. <laughs> the police are proxy for white Philadelphia. It doesn't, it does not exculpate white Philadelphians from themselves being those boots on the ground. And Philly is very much a city where, unlike a lot of actually, a lot of Northeastern cities where white folks left for the suburbs, uh, white folks stayed in Philadelphia and they stayed very much in the area where most of the cops live, Northeast. And that city is still very much a battleground in ways that it was in the 40s, in ways that it was in the 50s. And so uh, Rizzo is a cop, right? And, and, the, and the cops are parts of families that are broader uh, in this fabric who have been policing those racial boundaries as citizens. 
uh, policing who gets to go to the schools and who who gets to live in what houses in which neighborhoods, uh, the police would show up. Uh, the police would uh, turn a blind eye, but you're absolutely right, Nicole, that the actual bodies on the ground were a, a mix of uh, those with badges and those without, and what they shared was white skin. And you said it's like Chicago. I mean, I grew up in Detroit and it's Detroit, it's Chicago. I mean, as Elizabeth's book showed, it is America, right? And uh, again, that's why this particular case, uh, this this history that Momia brings to us through his art, through his voice, through his writings, this is why that history is so important because it's it's not history, right? It, 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 his very presence still inside uh, of the Philadelphia prison system is evidence how uh, this is today. Amazing, thank you so much. I want to turn now to Elizabeth because there is, you know, I always felt like Chicago, I used to, I've written Chicago's ordinary in its dysfunction. And so it's easy to call these practices dysfunctional rather than interrogating um, how they, they matter, how they're functional, how they have a purpose, how they have what Brittany Friedman calls racist intent, meaning the intent to harm, right? The intent to segregate. Can you give us now pan back and Tell us why Mumia, as well as Philadelphia, is the American experience, is policing broadly, because that is something that people push back on me as well. Like, how Chicago goes, in my view, there goes the nation. So in your view and your research, tell me about Philadelphia and the nation and mass incarceration. Well, thanks so much for that question, Nicole, and for moderating this panel. I also just want to take a few minutes to um, Say some thank yous, and I'm and Todd and Heather just gave us such a rich background of Mumia's personal life history in Philadelphia in general. I'm just going to offer a few thoughts on the national perspective, as um, Nicole asked. But I, I also want to do a couple thank yous. Um, thank you to Amanda Strauss for inviting me to speak and for organizing this conference, and for Jennifer Braga also for handling all the logistics. And I just, as a historian, I just want to take a few. Um, moments to just acknowledge the significance of the Voices of Mass Incarceration collection um, here at the John Hay Library and, and how critical it is that we begin to document the life stories, the firsthand experiences, et cetera, of those who have experienced the horrors of the prison system and the criminal legal system firsthand. It is with these archives that we ensure that this history does not get lost and that this history is told properly from the perspective of people that experience it. In the absence of these archives, what historians will um, would have uh, to tell the, the, the history of mass incarceration and to talk about prison conditions would all be state records, which are necessary, but we need to have both. And so I am absolutely thrilled um, that this collection exists here at Brown. There are other collections I just want to shout out bri briefly. Heather is also um, through the Documenting Criminalization and Confinement Project at the University of Michigan, creating an archive of first person accounts. And Veshla Weaver, um, and Doran Larson, based at Johns Hopkins, um, have started the American Prison Writing Archive, where incarcerated people um, are encouraged and invited to submit um, writing of any kind, and um, it goes up online. So I also encourage everybody in the audience to check out those archives. Um, centering these, these voices are so is so, so key. So thank you for that, and I'm just incredibly honored to be a part of this. Um, so just kind of building from one of the uh, Heather's ideas and, and your question, Nicole, about just kind of like, you know, this being um, a racist intent nationally. I mean, I think, you know, we were talking about how police are a proxy for white folks in Philadelphia. But I think when we, you know, historically, right, police are a proxy for white supremacy, whether that is, um, you know, basically acting as um, an army of white settlers to police the space of indigenous people in the North American continent, or whether that is acting as um, slave patrols to um, uphold the slave system and prevent um, enslaved people from owning books or guns or planning to revolt, all of this, this is woven into the fabric of what the purpose and function of policing is supposed to be. And the other aspect of that, right, is that um, police are always called in um, 
to, to quell or to suppress or to squash um, movements for social justice, movements for racial justice, whether those movements are violent and nonviolent. And in that respect, I think, you know, um, Mumia Abu Jamal's life in many respects tracks on to both the concerted effort on the part of the state to suppress radical activism and black radicals in particular, but also the way that those efforts um, sustained and grew into a larger war on black communities as a whole through the war on crime and the war on drugs. So, you know, it's really significant, right, that, um, that Mumia, from what I understand, joined the Black Panther Party after he was beaten by police in 1968 while protesting a George Wallace um, rally in Philadelphia. That beating by police, um, you know, inspired him to join with the Panthers in the first place, right, which that time was popularly known as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and the community alert patrol and the awareness and protection that Panthers were offering vulnerable people, not just in Philadelphia, right, but in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in major cities and small and smaller cities, small towns even across the country. Um, the Panthers, um, you know, organized and mobilized as um, a, a unit of defense against um, state-sanctioned violence, against police abuse. So that was, um, that experience of police abuse is, is part of what in, inspired Mamiya to join with the movement in the first place. I think many of these tactics that were used against black radicals, um, Nicole, you mentioned Fred Hampton's, the raids that many um, agents of the FBI and Cointel Pro um, used to try to suppress and repress and obliterate um, black radical movements um, become a kind of everyday part of policing during the war on crime and the war on drugs through the mid 70s and 80s on, right? That we think of, you know, SWAT teams are kind of a ubiquitous part of policing today. They also, um, you know, premiered as part of this um, state-sanctioned attempt to suppress black radicalism. So the first SWAT team premieres at the uh, Black Panther headquarters in Los Angeles um, in, in, a, in a kind of seizure ambush that looks very much like what we see in the move bombing um, 16 years, yes, 16 years uh, later. So the, the tactics that, are, that kind of define policing today um, were first used against black radical groups, and I think that's something um, really important for us to keep in mind. And Elizabeth, yeah. before you move on, yeah. I, I think what was astounding to me when someone told me there was a move bombing, I didn't really understand what that was because it was hard to conceive of what that would look like in American City. Can you just give a couple words about what the move bombing was? Because we've, we've talked about it, but just to tell the audience that may not know. Well, Heather, I don't, you know, Heather's probably a better person to uh, <laughs> talk about the details of this than me. So actually, I, let, me, let, me, let me turn it over to you, Heather, because I don't want to get anything wrong. You're the expert on MOVE. I mean, I, no, I don't want to take your time, Elizabeth. Go ahead. You there's, no, there, there's, no, there's no time. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, basically this is a this is a protracted long term uh, attempt on the part of the Philly PD to uh, rein in this organization, uh, this family of members that called themselves MOVE and still do. And this is an event that happens on a street in Philadelphia on the sort of west side of the city on an Osage Avenue where there was a MOVE home uh, that in inside of that home were men, women, and children. And the police come to serve a warrant in uh, 1985 to get uh, them out of the house by the way, knowing full well that there are children in this house. And it is a, essentially a police uh, assault of really kind of catastrophic and historic proportions. You know, hundreds and hundreds of officers, thousands and thousands of bullets shot into the house. And the upshot of it ultimately uh, is that uh, there are folks inside of the house trying to get out, but they can't. Uh, there is a packet of explosive dropped by the Philadelphia PD on the roof of this row house. And if you know anything about Philadelphia's architecture, you know what row houses look like and how tightly packed in together they are. And once this packet of explosives is dropped with, again, bullets also raining into the house from the outside, uh, you can imagine it is a horror show. 
There are men, women, and children, and many dogs uh, burned alive in that home, and only two people actually managed to make it out of the house alive. One woman, Ramona Africa, one small nine-year-old boy, Birdie Africa. And what is so extraordinary about that event is that despite major investigations, despite a grand jury investigation, the only person that was ever charged for anything related to that event uh, was Ramona Africa, the one surviving person who came out of that, uh, with the one surviving adult that came out of that. So that's really the nutshell. But re remember that the police, this is again connected to Momia because Momia's event had already happened. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is again, this long-term sense ever since dealing, the police were, you know, got a bead on move. By the way, very few members of in the organization initially, but they were already under surveillance by the FBI, already under surveillance by uh, the Red Squad, effectively, of the Philly PD from the day they, the day they named themselves. And uh, it was just a protracted uh, battle that all comes to a head in 1985. And thank you for that clarification. I yeah, because yes. I think I think it's almost impossible to imagine the level of violence. Like when I saw the move um, photos, just to see the city block, like and how it looked, just completely demolished. And I, you know, it, I just think it's important that we pause for a second to understand the scale of violence and the scale of the attack, because you know, especially for the oh, students here. Two city, two full city blocks. Two full city blocks. Right there we go. Off of the map right. of the city of Philadelphia. This was a right. uh, vibrant black middle class neighborhood. This is where, you know, people who worked for the post office worked and, and you know, school, school teachers lived. These are homeowners and every one of those houses were reduced to rubble. Two right. full city blocks. Right. And that to me is a message, right? It's not just, I mean, it's similar to a lynching. It's like, it's not the death of one, it's the its the terror for many. And so, Elizabeth, I hope you can go back yeah. to your other remarks. I just wanted to pause there just so we understand truly the magnitude of, of racial violence. Can you it's go on? It's the disregard and, yeah. for black life, for black communities, for mar racially marginalized groups that is uh, built into the fabric of this nation, and again, which is you know precisely why um, the police become the agents of the states that uh, of the state that are this proxy for white supremacy, and we see this devaluation, you know, right through mass incarceration and through um, death row. And I think I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, uh, so you know, Mumia is um, kind of, excuse me, his life tracks onto these national crime control policies that are waged by, in many cases, local police forces and state level prison systems. And by the time his case, you know, is making its way through appeal and um, is getting, and rightly so, more public attention um, and, and advocacy around it, this is also the moment when mass incarceration, you know, the war on drugs is taking off, mass incarceration, um, prison populations are exploding, you know, they, they truly, truly explode to astronomical levels after the 94 crime bill. But even by the late 80s, early 90s, you know, there was a growing awareness about the way that capital punishment in particular um, was, was aggravating, was perpetuating racial inequities. And, and, and in many states, um, including Pennsylvania, you know, the people sitting on death row were almost exclusively people of color and, and black people in particular. So, you know, the entire arc from being abused by police for protesting, from being surveilled, there are hundreds of pages of FBI surveillance documents, at least that we know of um, on Mumia in this earlier period, to, um, to his case and to his um, arbitrary unjust sentence reflects this larger national problem um, that relies on police and criminalization and prisons to kind of be the, the proxy for white supremacy, but the way that inequality in this country um, has been managed by governmental authorities from the very beginning. Thank you so much. Uh, Todd, I wanna turn to you. I felt that um, um, Johanna Fernandez gave some wonderful remarks yesterday about kind of the racial trope of quote unquote cop killer. And so here you gave your one minute bio and please you feel free to extend more about the bio, but we get a, a picture of who Mumia was 
prior, right? An activist, a thinker, a journalist, a radio journalist. And then here is this crime and the police now can give him a new kind of moniker of this quote unquote cop killer. Can you talk a little bit in terms of your work thinking through that shift in the lens and like the resistance, because we did hear that quote from Pam Africa, kind of resisting and talk, you know, pushing back on that, but can you talk a little bit about your writing and work, seeing that transition from Mumia, this thinker, activist, scholar, to boom, this kind of racialized figure? Well, he was a reporter first and just a guy, I mean, Folks, you know, we don't want to take Mumi Bujumal and turn him into a, a Kevin Feige produced superhero, okay? This is a normal guy who had normal influences, and I'll list some names later on about those influences. He has the same power that you have, and I want to emphasize that. Really, you have more power than he does. You have YouTube, you have the ability to speak to the entire world, Instagram, now, TikTok. What you say, of course, is determined by who you are. Mumia has been consistent because of the forces that have created him. So the only difference between Mumia and you is that you have been created by different forces, what Cornel, what, what Cornel West would call market forces. Mumia was created by community forces. Mm -hmm. And those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. and, be, and before <coughs> I answer your question, I just want to point out that you don't have to depend on an elite institution like Brown to look up to see these first person prisoner uh, focuses. First of all, again, Noel Hanrahan with prison radio. Uh, Mumia was a project of prison radio and she <coughs> discovered him through activists and started to record him and this is how we all became to know about Mumia, but through these re initial recordings that went on Democracy Now, Democracy Now called all sorts of hell. This was back when Democracy Now was a much more radical program. Uh, but, and they caught all sorts of hell by, by airing Mumia. But there's also a place called Prison Archives mm -hmm. by a man named Claude yeah. Marx. And people like Noel and Claude, they do very lonely work doing this stuff by themselves, archiving these prisons so that you and I can go online and see them. And so I just wanted to point that out. So there are many sources that you can go to. Now, in terms of your question, okay. I want to piggyback off of both what my amazing panelists have said, because there are, there are real people involved here, just like there are real people involved in your life that help shape you. You're being shaped right now, right? And there are several people you're coming to and drawing from and gathering from that are shaping your life. Mumia was exactly like you. The only difference is he was very restless, and he was restless during a time in which you could get away with being restless because there were so many jobs and different opportunities. But when we talk about what our, our panels are talking about, we have to talk about transitions that happened in Philadelphia. The transition from a Joe Rainey, a more conciliatory NAACP president, to Cecil Moore, who was a black nationalist follower of Malcolm X, who was so radical as president of the NAACP, the national NAACP stepped in, broke up his chapter in the different corners so that he would never have that kind of power again. And who was Joe Rainey's vice president? A man named Georgie Woods, the man with the goods, a DJ, a DJ. So imagine you have a black nationalist president of the NAACP, a father of Malcolm, a president of the NAACP, and you have a DJ who can organize the people, who, ha who has the power to organize the youth as your VP. This is the kind of environment that Mumia Abu Jamal was in. And I want you to always read grassroots writers like James Spady, who's been forgotten, who should not be forgotten, because he documents a lot of this stuff and he's done a biography on Georgie Woods. So when we talk about Mumia Abu Jamal, we talk about people when they got radicalized and then you go into Mumia's captain in terms of his uh, Black Panthers, Reggie Shell, another name that has been forgotten. A man who took an hour and a half out of going to a Black Panther reunion to sit with me in a hallway with some stairs and let me interview him for an hour and a half. Because that's how much he cared about Mumia Abu Jamal. Reggie Shell influenced Mumia Abu Jamal and brought him, once he got into, be a, into being a Panther, into a more radical tradition. 
Now, when Mumia got into radio, we need to mention other names. E. Stephen Collins, who was a colleague of Mumia Abu-Jamal's. Bernie McCain, who Mumia Abu-Jamal fought with over using some move footage in a radio broadcast. These are legendary names in black radio that have been forgotten. Uh, we have to talk about Wynn Moore, who also uh, you know, would fight with Mumia. Mumia would fight with these radio supervisors over what to air. Now, what happened to Mumia was a couple of things. One, he became an adherent to Mood, and that crossed over into him being an advocate for Move on Air, and that's why he got fired. It wasn't because he reported on police brutality. A whole bunch of black reporters in the black press and in black radio reported on police brutality. Mumia crossed over into advocacy on the radio, and that's what got him out. But even before he did that, he was always advocating for people. And I want you to understand this, students. He turned down what today would be a six-figure job in local television news. Mm -hmm. They wanted him for local television news. But he would have to cut his dreads. And he didn't want to cut his dreads. And there's a famous photo of when he does a tryout for local television news. He has a hat on. And he's interviewing Dr. J, Julius Irvin. But he turned down that because he believed in community empowerment, community development, and the self-determination that comes from autonomy. The same things you believe in, because you're on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. The only difference is he was using these things for black liberation. That's the only difference between Mumia and, and you. And that's because of the forces that were happening around in Philadelphia and across the country in the 70s. Because I think it's very important to add to what these two are saying, mm -hmm. because what these two are saying is laying the drop, is laying the, the background, the mm -hmm. backdrop for a very individual story. But we all have individual stories. Every professor you have had a, has an individual story. Let me tell you all your professors' individual stories. They were walking down the street one day, and they fell in love with something. And they fell in love with something, and it was so deep to them that they decided to go read every book on it. And they decided to go write things, and they decided to go get student loans, because they were in love <laughs> with this thing. Right? That's why you're wondering, like, why is this guy, why is this guy, why do they know all these details about this boring stuff? Because they love that boring stuff. Whatever it is, <laughs> they love that stuff. That's why they're here. Right? So Mumia is not different from them. Mumia is not different from you. He was just brought together by these forces, but he was also brought together by people who he had to battle with, people who he had to learn from, people who he had to grow from. And that's why all of these people, Johanna Fernandez, all of these people, Michael Schiffman, that's why they're all attracted to him and write books about him or write books with him. Mark Lamont Hill wrote a book with Mumia Abu Jamal because they understand not only the needs of the external forces, but in the needs of the internal forces. Once you get into that tension, you will find your path. But where Mumia does differ from all of us is that he had the bravery to go down his path without worrying about consequences. And that's what leads to him going into a glove compartment with a gun that was licensed to him to go cross a street. But I'm sorry, I don't know if, if that was the answer to your question. That's an amazing answer. You could answer any question you want. That was awesome. Um, I, I have this, uh, I'm, I'm thinking through policing on my own, and I have, the start of one of my chapters is, uh, police are not the crime fighters you think they are. Uh, so I want to maybe turn to Heather for a second. We just got that climactic moment that Mumia has a gun. And I guess I want to just understand, before anybody vilifies for that movement of reaching for a gun, what was it like for black people in Philadelphia at that time to feel like they had to protect themselves? So for instance, you, there was a sense about the Black Panther Party and self-defense. How were black Philadelphians thinking about their self-defense? given the fact that the so-called protectors of the city were their perpetrators? I mean, you know, this, this notion that uh, we have been bequeathed that one is safe with the police. 
Uh-oh. Hold on one second, Heather. We lost you. Let's try again. I can hear you now. <laughs> um, this notion that the police are what make communities safe is something that uh, kids are taught in school and rarely unless they live in very, very privileged environments, does it feel true? And that was true in Philadelphia for uh, for any Black Philadelphian then, it's true now. And so how do people make themselves feel safe? Uh, it's not calling 911. And in fact, the sight of a police officer makes someone feel a hell of a lot less safe. So this idea of being armed this idea that you would maybe see four police officers coming near you and <laughs> reaching for a gun, this idea that you have to protect yourself because there are no authorities whom you can call to protect you, is so much the daily and lived experience of people who live in cities, primarily uh, in cities like Philadelphia and, and Detroit and Chicago, but also, of course, in rural America, that we can't be surprised uh, when we hear these stories. What we should be surprised by is this, this idea that people still, uh, this fantasy, right, that, that people still have, that it is the police that makes make communities safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it, not only is that not the lived experience <laughs> of so many people, but it's actually the opposite of that lived experience. And so when, you know, Todd takes us into this moment where, you know, Mamiya is driving a cab in North Philly, um, you know, this idea that uh, that he would have felt safe enough perhaps not to be armed is actually what's remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that he would be armed. But even in that, even in that episode, right, even in the episode that would be so life-changing for him, the one where he is the, you know, an officer is killed, he is also on the verge of death, right, because of his injuries. There is no way to even begin to understand what that moment looks like in isolation. This is why that prehistory is so important, because whatever facts people think they have about that moment, uh, we don't eat, we can't even trust the facts quote unquote, in these moments as they present themselves in trials, as, as they are presented to juries by DAs, because we have so much overwhelming preponderance of the evidence that the facts don't matter, actually, when these altercations happen. Uh, what matters is the conviction, and what matters is that cops uh, basically are exonerated for the shooting that they did. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I could just very please, quickly please. add to that. We forget that Lynn Abraham was the DA at the time and the death penalty was like the default mm -hmm. uh, sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so people who complain about Mamiya Boutjamal's behavior during the trial, and by the way, I'm one of those people, I had to understand that there was only gonna be one sentence once, once it was murder, it was gonna be the death penalty. And it was so long ago, to give you an idea how long Mamiya Boutjamal's been in prison, when he was sentenced, he was sentenced to the electric chair Oh. That's how long ago it was. Oh. So we have to remember the, right. the, the context of, of, of Philadelphia as well. And, and, and that's what she's saying in terms of, of Mumia, because Mumia, he's 28 when he's going through this, 28, 29. And I believe he's thinking about how Afeni Shakur of the Panther 21 defended herself and got off. He's thinking about how John Africa defended himself and got off. So I think that his behavior during the trial is not only based on the fact that he knew he was getting set up mm -hmm. and that he didn't like his lawyer, it's that he also understood that a disruptive trial might be turning it into a political trial might assist him mm -hmm. because he understood the corruption of the system anyway. Yeah. And so his self-defense, which was quite extraordinary in the early days of trial, because you know, Maureen Faulkner complains that none of us read the trial transcript. Well, I read the trial transcript. So his uh, defense of himself, is, his selection of the jury, is just extraordinary in the beginning. But then he sees that the fix is in. And then he decides to take, you know, depending on the time of day, I'll say reckless, mm -hmm. <laughs> brave, naive. I mean, I, I'm still trying to figure these things out. I'm still learning things. But, but that gives you the context 
Because when we talk about resistance, Mumia, from the point of view, again, of the forces that have shaped him, knows nothing other than resistance. He gets kicked out of high school for trying to organize to turn Benjamin Franklin High School into Malcolm X. So, so he, he, he sees resistance as normal, where we see market culture, a brand, as normal. Mm -hmm. Cornel West says, I'm not trying to do a brand, I'm trying to support a cause, I'm following a cause. We've got those things confused. Mm -hmm. So all of the brilliance and talent that Mumia Abu-Jamal has, that you have, goes into a brand so that you can market yourself and maybe one day be on a stage with Barack and Michelle Obama. But you've been taught that. Whereas Mumia Abu-Jamal was taught that what was important was to be free. And being free meant you had to engage in something called struggle for something called revolution. Mm -hmm. That is the main difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Todd. I want to get to Q&A, but I want to give Elizabeth one more question here about something I've been thinking about. We were really, obviously, very careful about the language um, in the press releases, in the marketing. You know, the word prisoner is such a derogatory term um, for this new generation. So we say incarcerated person, et cetera. But Mumia, from my understanding, has really embraced the notion of being a political prisoner like, and, and sees that as a particular type of identity. But I guess the larger question for me regarding mass incarceration is, if Mumia is a political prisoner, what about the 2.5 million other people mm -hmm. that are incarcerated all over the nation? Is that an appropriate term for them as well, based on your research? Well, that's a, that's, that's a great it's a question. Big one. It's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, this actually gets back to that question of intent, right? Um, I am guilty of exactly what you were talking about, Dr. Burroughs, and that I um, became obsessed with trying to figure out, um, based on trying to understand things about my own family who were incarcerated, how mass incarceration happened. And I did that by scouring every record I could get my hands on in every presidential administration from Kennedy to Reagan. My interpretation of those archives and my interpretation of the memos and the meeting min minutes and the internal discussions that these policymakers were having at the highest level of government is that, you know, we were talking about uh, the, the kind of context of Philadelphia in the 40s, 50s. By the early 60s, policymakers were really concerned about demographic realities in, in major US cities because of the great migration. They were concerned that appeared that the population of black youth were growing and uh, there weren't enough jobs for these youth. So, for, so we get various federal interventions, none of them structural. Um, all of them, you know, we don't get a job creation program, we get job training programs, we get homemaking programs, we get remedial education, we don't get an overhaul of public schools through the war on poverty, all these things. Um, but, but these policymakers and the social scientists they consulted decided to target um, generations of black youth. Mm -hmm. And the, in, as such, the policies of the war on crime, right? Heather mentioned earlier that you know, the war on crime was in many ways, that, with that Johnson declares in 65, a response to the threat of continued rebellion after the summer of 64, after what happened in Philadelphia and other cities. Um, as such, policing strategies became preemptive. They didn't actually respond to crime that was happening, but a crime that, was, that, that could potentially happen. So policymakers start talking about potential criminals and potential delinquents yeah. who are labeled literally in, the in, in legislation as you know, young people who attend urban public schools, whose families might be on welfare, who live in housing projects. It's even without using the racialized language after Jim Crow, these policies are very, very racialized. Um, so in that sense, there, there, there was, and certainly by the Nixon administration, an attempt to deal with um, the, the problem of inequality by locking people up. I'll give one like really, really stark example of this. Um, one of the, the most haunting things I found in the archives was in the Nixon administration, um, these documents that literally were called the Long Range Master Plan for a complete overhaul of the federal prison system, but this plan policymakers also imposed on the states. And 
they began in 1970 to project for prison populations, which I still can't really get my mind on. This goes to the kind of like preemptive nature of these crime control strategies. How do you project who's gonna be in prison? And it, you see these graphs and it's crazy. I mean, it's like 1970 and then by 1980, it's gonna be really high. There was one in Ronald Reagan's um, gubernatorial archives where they projected where the, the number of non-white incarcerated people in California would eclipse the number of white prisoners. And this was around 1973 and sure enough, that's what happened nationally. But initially these projections were based on the forecasts of the Crime Commission and the Kerner Commission, presidential task forces that Johnson called. Um, and they, they, they projected, uh, they made population projections on the, on the number of black youth because this was the population that policymakers were obsessed with. And so based on uh, these projected numbers of black youth in the nation, uh, the Nixon administration began to project for prison population. So that's one tie. Mm -hmm. But the other tie that's just infuriating to me is when these um, black youth population projections were discounted by the mid-1970s, policymakers still continued to rely on, on, uh, on projections, prison projections, based on census figures, based on uh, figures. And they then began to rely on unemployment figures. So you have the federal government planning to build prisons, planning for prison beds, based on the number of people who are unemployed, because they knew there's a correlation between employment opportunities and incarceration. So rather than just giving people jobs, right. spending the money for a job right. creation program. Now, right. law enforcement and prison guards got a job creation program in the war on crime and later the war on drugs, but we never got a job creation program for low-income people of color. And when you're projecting by the mid-1970s at the dawn of mass incarceration, right. prisons based on unemployment rates, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. this is, indicates that prisons are a proxy for white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. So, 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 yeah, so, so, in, so in that sense, in that sense, in that sense, right, we can think of the generations yeah. of women and men of color who have been systematically removed from their communities and most likely taken to a rural prison right. to live out extremely long sentences or their lives or to be put for death. Yes. Yes. Um, they are political prisoners. Amen. Can, can I add something quickly to what yes, you said? Please, Ben, ben Jealous taught me this when I used to work for him. They also, and I know you know this, they also used to decide where to build prisons based on how bad the schools were. It's yeah. a, it's a similar yeah. logic. Because similar they logic knew the that, okay, yeah. if these schools are bad, these kids are not gonna stay in school, or they're gonna graduate without certain skills, and they're gonna go into crime, and then we can grab them. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. It's, it's worse. It's worse because they've all planned this, and they planned this in, over decades. Now, when people want to be dramatic and sexy, they want to talk about a conspiracy, right? Okay. I don't know why we talk about a conspiracy because so many things, as you've now seen through the Trump administration and now maybe the Trump administration again, all these things are done openly, right? The only conspiracy that we can actually prove is, of course, COINTELPRO because they were dumb enough to keep all those paperwork and we had some radical activists who went and broke in and showed that the paperwork existed, right? If those activists hadn't done that, we'd still be arguing over whether the papers existed, mm -hmm. right? That's the, only, that's the only conspiracy we can, we can prove in terms of being done in private. Everything else, and, and I, I want to know if you dis, disagree or agree with me or not, everything else is public policy mm -hmm. that's defined by people in power. And the only thing that, that you're maybe shocked by is that Trump so doesn't care. He decides to articulate all of this publicly. So when he sets up a conspiracy, he sets up a conspiracy by calling people on the phone and asking for votes, right? Which is crazy, right? That there, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, shadowy about that. He's doing it publicly on the phone with people because he wants power. Mm -hmm. Power now is kind of opened up. And that's why you see things that we used to call conspiracies. Yeah. Can I just say one yes, last thing please. on that? And yeah. this is something that I, I also wanted to raise when we were talking about um, policing, and I'm really excited for Q&A, but just last thing. On the conspiracy point, I mean, can anybody, this is a genuine question, because I, I say this, but if somebody, please prove me wrong, or give me another example. Tell me a policy, right, 
that has occurred, you know, now we're going on like almost 60 years of this war on crime that has failed so miserably. In the communities where police are most energetically implemented, those communities also suffer from the highest rates of gun violence. Mm -hmm. So the police don't help make, the, they have failed to make us safe. We know that mass incarceration also has nothing to do with crime or keeping communities safe. Yet despite all of this, and despite the fact that we know <laughs> what the solutions are. We know that community-based alternatives work better and they're so much more cost-effective. Why is it mm -hmm. that we still continue to invest billions and billions of dollars? Why is it that in 2020, 2021, when gun violence peaked again, there was a spike in gun violence, why isn't that we didn't take a step back and say, you know what? Actually, these policing programs really aren't working, so let's, try, let's actually think about defund. Let's think about divesting. Let's think about a different set of resources. No, it's always double down, invest more into this thing that has failed. It continues to fail. So I don't know if there's, I cannot think of any other domestic policy that has been such a, a failure, a demonstrated failure, and yet it's still the go-to of investment for, as a solution that doesn't work and doesn't keep us safer. Amen, and that's well, where you get to- it does oh, work. It well, does, right. well, yeah, it does work See, it in the, does work. yeah, in the, so in the, the racist so the intent the, of the, the policy, problem. right? Um, I, this has been an amazing discussion from everybody. I want to now bring it to the audience. Um, if you can speak up loud and I'll, I could restate it in the, in the microphone. Oh, we had a mic, so here it comes. Here they come. It was a great panel. And I just wanted to say a few things about Philly that are real for us, um, because I live there. Uh, there are 6,500 police officers, majority white police officers. Larry Krasner has said in the Atlantic Magazine, everybody knows that they arrest people with false arrest warrants just to bump their pay. It is an assembly line of black and brown bodies in the Juanita Kid Injustice Center. That is what happens. I went to Kenyatta Johnson's legislative directory as a city council member, and he, he said, oh no, I know why we, can't fix the, why we can't fix the potholes and why we can't fund the schools. It's because of police overtime. 6,500 fraternal order of police lodge five. 6,000 retired police officers with full pay. That's 12,000 vastly majority white and getting whiter every second. They are the sons of Rizzo. What does that mean to live in Philly? It means my African-American 17-year-old son was shot on August 12th of this year in Taconi, a contested neighborhood, by a white kid. Do the police care? No. So I'm just saying, it's real. It's happening still. And in Mumia Abu-Jamal is the third rail. If we bring him home, if he is free as he needs to be free, then the contradiction of Ed Rendell being the mayor, Lynn Abraham, will come to fruition. Not enough to archive, not enough to produce his books, not enough to produce radio. Mumia Abu-Jamal is a man who has a family who needs to come home. Here we go. Great, um, great, great panel, I really learned, learned a lot. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna just try to make it simple. Uh, um, so, so basically, my name is Kirk Boone. I, I did an oral history for Columbia University on my personal family, right? Uh, how we experienced mass incarceration. So, um, but I'll just make quickly. Uh, one of my cousins, you know, I interviewed. She's a female. She had about. 15 years in prison, coming from Brooklyn, right, selling drugs, and one of her things was she knew she was doing something wrong, right, but she did it anyway, right? And then another cousin on the interview, right, he was a homicide detective in Brooklyn, right? And then me, I'm doing interviews, I'm a brand guy. So <laughs> I wear sneakers for Converse, right? Go around the country wearing brand new Converse, doing books, and I'm one of the brand guys. So, to you guys, and, and my mission is to try to like, how do we keep young people out of this system, out of this mass incarceration system? And if it means 
preaching them, get A, a grades, and getting a new pair of brand new sneakers, so be it. At least you're not getting drove to prison. So to you guys, I like to see what's going to come out of this. Like, you know, what's the strategy going forward for the next 50 years, right? I got this. Like, I'm learning a lot. But where we go the next 50 years? God, we hate to see us, like, continually to struggle and continually battle this prison system. We must find a strategy where we can fight it. So I'd love to hear from uh, Nicole the psychology of it, because it's definitely psychology, and it, and it also tied on the branding thing, and maybe uh, uh, Elizabeth will say a few words as well. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you for that question. I hope I, let me uh, think about this a little bit. I think so, some sociologists were a little, um, I don't know, pessimistic. I mean, our, the fault of my field is that we don't give agency or power to individuals because we look at these statistics and think, oh my God, employment, unemployment is so high and these arrest rate, rates are so high. I mean, how do you even protect a child in the area around the Cecil B. Moore stop right where um, like Temple University is? What do you do? What do we say to that child? So I'd love to maybe have the panelists take that. I mean, Heather, why don't we start with you? What, what hope do you see? What, is, what, what might be a place of hope in the next 50 years? I mean, it's really tough, you know, because I go back to what Elizabeth said, which is we know what works. Just like we know what doesn't work, we know what works. If you look at the communities around the nation that are the quote unquote safest by all measures, where kids can play in the park and not worry about getting shot, where they can take public transit and and uh, their parents aren't terrified every time they leave the door. What are the common denominators about those places? Not policing, not barbed wire, not high rates of incarceration, but resources. Yeah. It, is, it is so basic, actually. It is so fundamentally basic. And as historians, Elizabeth and I get frustrated, I know, because we look at other moments Every time resources have been put in to any community, it matters. Any time, even the most benign uh, injection of resources, such as during the Great Society. I mean, that just looks like a compared to now. I mean, those amount of resources in things like you know, child nutrition or education or student loan. I mean, you name it, right? So we know what makes those communities safe. And knowing that is not translating into certain communities. Well, we tend to always just go to those people and say, well, you know, behave, do the right thing. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking of the gentleman's last comment, you know, like, you know, it's wrong. Don't do it. Or, you know, get a job or, you know, don't sell drugs, work at a, you know, work at a reputable firm. And of course, you know, that would be wonderful, but we constantly are going to be struggling if we do not recognize that what keeps people safe and successful and all of the things that we want for this nation have to come from resources. And certainly div divesting from police and putting those resources where they would be more useful is a very concrete way of doing that. But I actually think of the psychology of this. We can't even do that until we value everybody's children equally. Yeah. And so this is as much of a hearts and minds issue as it is a policy issue. And that's why it is so important that people speak up about this and are active about this. Uh, black people, white people, everybody has to speak up about this because it is about everybody's kids. And when it is about resources, you know how horrifying it would be if we didn't know the answer? We have this behemoth of a failed program and we're, we're sitting here scratching our heads and saying it's terrible, but we don't know what to do about it. The good news is we know what works. We know what makes safe communities safe. We know what makes kids succeed. We just have to do it. And that's the part where speaking up is so critically important. Elizabeth, do you want to take a lightning round on that one? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, it's important to remember, just like, again, as a historian, you know, in, in 1860, nobody thought that slavery would be abolished. Um, I think that it, it, we do have decades of struggle ahead, but as a student of the freedom movement, 
that's what we do. We keep struggling. We stand up to injustice. Um, I do, I am, you know, I tend to be, I think the point that Heather made, we know the solution, so we're like already halfway there is an important one. And I take a lot of inspiration, especially from younger generations, um, from my students, both my incarcerated students and my students um, on campus. I do agree too that it's gonna be, it's, it's a hearts and minds issue in part. You know, we really, uh, we're gonna have to move and come to a different kind of collective consciousness as a nation in order to make um, a more equitable society, in order to realize justice um, mm -hmm. for everyone. And Todd, what do you, what do you think is moving no, forward? I'm, I'm yielding to You're historians good? on this. What? They, they've studied this, and so they're giving forecasts based <laughs> on what they've studied. No, no. <laughs> Well, I, I will say the thing about resources, again, as a sociologist, um, you know, uh, my friend Robert Vargas, he's a, um, a sociologist at University of Chicago, and he shows that the same number, excuse me, the same um, area, it's a Mexican area that has high crime, one side of the street has a lower murder rate, lower crime rate than the other side of the street. So blaming the people, blaming the culture, blaming uh, the toxicity of a people, is, is blown out of the water because how is it possible? Well, he shows that politically it's gerrymandered. So that the same neighborhood, Little Village is where my, my father's from, one side gets resources for, for violence prevention, which includes things like escorts to walk to school and lights and uh, uh, community uh, partnerships with police and all these other things that we know make for healthy communities. And the other side is gerrymandered to have a representative that doesn't advocate for those things. And so you have crime rates that are totally separate on these kind of border passageways, which shows, again, that we know how to do this, right? We know, and, and I think blaming communities is the worst thing that we can do. Um, but when we're putting all this funding into bad strategies, cri they call it crime science. That's my favorite thing. When you have to put science behind the thing, it shows it's probably not a good science, right? Um, like forensic science, right? It usually means it might be manipulated a little bit by the police, right? So I think, but education system in place like Philly, even the gentrified schools, uh, my child's teacher got mesothelioma from asbestos exposure. You know, tell me again how that child's supposed to get an education or any child in Philly if that's the well-resourced, you know, public school, right? So these are the, we have to all, I feel like, have the political will as well. Um, can we get more questions for who else, Scott? Are you talking about the Burge? Yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk. So what's interesting about John, John Burge was a um, police officer that was really emblematic of a, a whole brand of policing in Chicago. So some people call him a rogue officer, but he was not. Uh, he was absolutely not. He had marching orders in a quote unquote cop killer case to just go crazy and torture black men in mass it went on for 30 years, prosecutors took the cases, and he basically imported uh, war-style uh, torture from Vietnam into cities. And so it was a different type of violent oppression. It wasn't a move bombing, but it stretched for decades. And so there was a fight to get reparations, and a, the 130 men that were tortured were able to get some kind of remedy from the city. And so, you know, it's a big settlement, but shared between many different people. But one of the most important things about the settlement that made it truly radical is that they are forcing Chicago public school children to learn the history. And you can imagine that white Chicagoans that are blue, if you will, that have enclaves of Chicago officers are fighting this truth. They are fighting it. So. I don't know what that would look like. I, Todd, is, do you have a vision? I would love to hear your vision. What would reparations look like? That's... Well, our yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That it, it is on the plans, it can happen, it needs a mandate, and then people will be educated about what the police really Yeah, absolutely. What, what she well, said. Okay, you agree with that? <laughs> I mean, you know, and again, as we get to this larger national fight about, you know, people attacking CRT and people attacking teaching African American history, I mean, the most contentious part was not the money settlement, right? You know, the city of Chicago pays out, I think, a half a billion dollars in a decade for everything from murder to sexual assaults of, you know, officers attacking, you know, black and brown people. It wasn't the money. It was about telling the truth, and I think that's really important. I see another can question. Just, oh, yeah, just go ahead. One, go I just want to use that too to say, you know, like how again, how important this archive is, and how important documenting, you know, because without these historical materials, this gets lost. And we're right now, we are in a war over telling the truth yeah. about this nation, and the like. Th this documentation, telling these stories, is so critical, um, not only to understand how we got here, to, but think about how we move forward. And I just want to mention one more website. Again, you know, the, the elite institutions, I'm glad Brown did this, but there are also other people uh, doing this. There's a website called Rise Up North, done by uh, one of our champions in New Jersey, Junius Williams, a civil rights lawyer and activist. Rise Up North is currently divided into two parts, but I know he wants to expand it. One is on the Newark, New Jersey rebellion, which I'm intimately uh, connected to because I've been born and raised in Newark. And the other is a whole website on the history of the rebellion in Detroit. And you get a lot of information, first person information that you would not get from other sources. So again, this, this, this stuff is being done, the work is being done, but it's being done in kind of silos. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for you folks, you know, ChatGPT only knows so much of this, right? Yeah. That, you know, you know, <laughs> up to 2021, right? That, you know, but now ChatGPT, I just read, can now connect to the web, so maybe it'll, it'll know more, right? Um, but these things have to be searched for. Again, I told you, Mumia was a searcher. These things have to be searched for. And I'm warning you, if you search for them, you'll find them. If you find them, you may fall in love. If you may fall in love, you may disappoint a lot of people in your life <laughs> who, who want you to be on stage with Michelle and Barack Obama. <laughs> we want you to have a brand and not a cause. Yeah, thank you so much. I see a I'd question like, over there. I'd like to um, oh, ask, oh. ask a question. Oh, okay. um, Sorry about that. We'll get you next. Go ahead. Um, Elizabeth, Hi, you talked a little bit about the, um, well, both you and Heather talked about the bombings uh, move and um, um, other, other radical agencies. But I was a little girl in L.A., and um, Patricia Hirsch joined the SLA. And I remember the people being burned alive on Central Avenue. And I just want to ask you, you know, where around the nation, how many places around the nation has been attacked and people bombed or, or, or um, fried or, you know, burnt alive. How many places in the history, you know, of this nation, I guess it goes all the way back. I was thinking about um, the church bombings and the little kids being burned, but, but as resistance, how many places, sites, are we looking at as a nation? Countless. Okay. I mean, it's, it's so, it's so, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we hear you, Heather. You know, I love that question because it, it is so important to realize that every time people have spoken up to change the racial status quo or the economic status quo, or put it more bluntly, to challenge white supremacy and capital. Every time that has happened in American history, whether it's workers in a strike, whether it is civil rights workers, whether it is, uh, I mean, it just, you, you literally cannot come up with any moment in American history where someone has not tried to level the playing field, challenge inequality, and challenge injustice 
when in those moments, the state, the government, the city officials, wherever it is at that moment, calls out members of law enforcement, be it the military, be it the police, be it private security guards, to reestablish that order, to make sure that the color line stays where it is, to make sure that economic injustice stays the way that it is. And so every time that happens, there are casualties, terrible casualties. Mm -hmm. There are the ones we know about, like Fred Hampton. There are the ones we are increasingly learning about, like the MOVE victims. But there are thousands of unnamed people who have suffered that. And so that's, again, why the story is so important to tell, because what is also true, and I loved when Elizabeth said this, it's also true that the needle does move when people stand up against those things. So for all of those victims and for all of those martyrs and for all of that violence, we do not, minus in prison, we do not today hold people in chattel bondage. That is as the result of people standing up, of 4 million freed people standing up in the South in the 1860s. We do not yet, and God help us, I hope we don't yet ever return to some of those moments that we no longer have because people stood up. So yes, those, those stories of violence and state repression every time someone challenges inequality exist, but it's also true that we do move the needle in those moments as well. And that's the, we got to know that history or else it's all going to feel like uh, a disaster on the one hand or a whole lot of people suffering will go unmarked and either one is not okay. And the other question I, I just kind of left out is what became of Patty Hurst? Do we know? She got to go home basically to her family. I mean, she was pretty much ultimately, ultimately nothing. She got to resume her life. She got to to marry into the same class to which she was born and get on with her life. Right. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Susan Burton, for that question. You know, the, the thing that I'll add, and, and I was thinking... Well, one, as Heather said, it is countless, and this is why history is so important. We'll never know, right? We will never know the extent of brutality that has been enacted against people of color, against people standing up for social justice, against people challenging the status quo in general. I think one of the things that I talk about in my, in my work and thinking about this is that um, slavery offered um, black people a kind of perverse protection because as property, their bodies were not as vulnerable to you know, yes. violence that would bring one to death, right? Because that's your property. Yes. Yes. Um, and this is where it gets a countless and overwhelming. After the Civil War, though, um, white mobs wreaked havoc on black people and their allies, and not just in the South, mm -hmm. but across the country. I think this is something that we really forget. And so while lynching you know, was justice, in the South, the vigilante mob was responsible for the for lynching. In the North, especially as black people were continuing to flee the terror of Jim Crow for northern for northern cities, black communities, especially thriving black communities, were massacred um, from Tulsa on down. So this again, and and it is you know after that period, really in the 1940s, when we get another wave of great migration, where police officers. Um, assume the fu many of the same functions as these white mobs did from the late 19th century through the mid 20th century. And this um, person right there has a quick question because this is it, we're at time. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the answer. Or that answer. Yes, thank, you. thank you for the question, Susan Burton, I love you. You get the final word, you get the final word. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for having this panel today. So much of what I'm hearing is kind of the contradiction between what we're going and what we're seeing today, seeing the archives, but also the undercurrent of capitalism itself and how so much of the issues that we have here today are really as a result of capitalism. And in my personal opinion, is the only way to kind of dismantle these structures. My question to you is we have these archives at Brown University. We know what Brown represents. We know what these buildings around us as represents. We have them here. How, how does that contradiction 
work and how do we try to work within those contradictions of capitalism and these elite structures? Okay, who can take this really quick because they're gonna kick me, kick me off and yell at me. That's a long one. We have to be, we have to be, we have to embrace these contradictions and, um, and, and work within them because if we're gonna, you know, when we, as we end mass incarceration and racism and yeah. class exploitation and patriarchy, it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take these institutions. These institutions have a responsibility because they were built mm. on the backs yes. of unpaid labor to address the continued inequalities in our country and it's up to us, especially students, have no idea at these institutions how much power you have to actually get these institutions to do what's right. And they're not yeah. gonna do it by the, on the goodness of their hearts, again, the history of our freedom struggle shows us that it takes, it's gonna take tireless organizing work, not just hashtags, not just blackouts on your Instagram account. It's gonna take real organizing, real setting up, real sleepless nights and activism, but we can achieve it. We just have to do it. Amazing. Be brave and bold enough to do I it. I need to end on that, and I wanna thank all our panelists in the audience. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. That was an absolutely incredible panel that took us into the biography of Mumia Abu-Jamal, deep into the city, history of Philadelphia, the nation, and of course, Nicole for beautiful moderating. Thank you for those questions and answers. We are now going to take a break for lunch. We will return at 125, where we will hear some poetry. We will have a panel on spaces of healing in the public realm. And then you are all warmly invited to walk over to the John Hay Library for the opening of our exhibition, Mumia Abu-Jamal, A Portrait of Mass Incarceration. Thank you, and I'll see you in a little bit. Mm -hmm.